them permission from our speakers. There you go. So you can visit our Anita Know How page for the recorded sessions and previous speakers. And if you would, if you have not already, if you want to change your name in your screen to your first and last, that way you can get the 0.25 education credits through USDF University. We submit the lists of NIDA participants to USDF who register the credits. You don't have to do anything. Um, before we get on to tonight's speaker, I'd like to remind everyone that entries will be opening April 11th for our June 4th and 5th spring shows at Fieldstone Show Park in Halifax. In addition to competing, you can also sponsor a class, advertise your business, or reserve vendor space. Don will be posting the website links for all these opportunities in the chat so you can uh, access them easily. We're also really excited to launch our virtual dressage show. Entries are open now until April 18th. Videos must be submitted by May 3rd. It's really a great opportunity to open the show season from your own barn. So having said all that tonight, please join me in welcoming Anna Buffini to discuss her journey with her horses through the levels. Anna's been successful in the FBI Grand Prix CDI Three Star, USEF Young Adult Frentina Cup Dressage National Championships, the FBI Young Rider Team and the North American Youth Championships. We're very excited, Anna, to have you with us tonight. And I understand you're joining us from Germany. So welcome. I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much for having me. It's always an honor to um, speak on things like this. Yes, I'm in Germany right now. I am here for the World Cup in Leipzig, and I'm super excited to be here. It really is kind of a surprise. I just started trying to qualify in January on a little bit of a whim, and my horse Davinia really blew us away and um, she gave us no choice but to keep trying to qualify and every show she kept getting better and better until she qualified and she was um, the second horse in the country with the freestyle and now we're here in Germany training at Klaus Balkenhals and we leave Monday for Leipzig and we show Thursday and Saturday and it's an absolute dream come true. Um, I'm so grateful to be here. And also I really owe the success as well to all of the horses that have brought me to this point. And that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about today is the, the horses from my past that I've competed on and owned and a lot of the training tools and tips that I've used with them and how they've gotten me to this point and how basically like every single horse I ride, I just try and learn tools and your toolbox just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that by the time, you know, you're on a Grand Prix horse, maybe, or, you know, whatever horse you're on, your toolbox is so big, whatever problems you face, you're able to pull out so many different tools to help fix whatever problem you're facing. And that is what has um, really helped me get to this point so far and helped me be successful in the Grand Prix is because of the horses I've had in my past. So the first horse, well, he's actually a pony. His name was Ramazadi. He bucked me off all the time. <laughs> he was very, very hot. He was very tense. And so he really taught me how to ride a hot horse in the show arena because you can do everything right. But if your horse still has tension, you're going to get marked down and your horse is going to um, every once in a while screw you over so um I remember my parents would just hold their breath by the end of every single extended canner if my horse was gonna buck or bolt or whatever because that's just who he was and you can't punish your horse for their natural tendencies but you can be clever and work your way around them and I'd say the number one thing that he taught me he was pretty bouncy and he's a pony so they have short choppy steps he helped me develop my seat. And that really is the number one thing you need for your riding career. For any horse, that is where it starts. That's the foundation. If you have a good seat, if you have a supple seat, if you have a strong seat and um, one that really is like uh, you, you stay close to your horse and you can feel so much with your seat and your legs and your back and your, your shoulder, it goes all the way up to your shoulder blades. Um, that's the foundation of your riding career, really. So the number one thing I can encourage everybody is that 
you need to work on your seat. You need to, if I, if I look at you sitting the trot, even if you're on a bouncy horse, it should look pretty. It should be a straight line from your ears to your hips, to your heels, your hips should be swinging and you should not be bouncing out of the saddle a ton. A little bit of bouncing is okay. Sometimes if the horse is really bouncy, I get it. Trust me. (laughs) Sometimes you can't always keep it, but I always think of keeping the material of my breeches against the leather of the saddle. And then a lot of times if it's really hard, kind of diagnose why maybe your seat's coming out the saddle, maybe you're gripping with your knees, maybe your heels are up. A huge thing that Gunter is so focused on is our position because the horse is a reflection of our position. So having, if you see Gunter ride, his heels are so far down. He looks like a statue on the horse. His seat never moves. His position never moves. No matter what the horse is doing, your position should always look the same because then no matter what your horse does, you're right here for it and your seat and your legs and your hands, they're ready to react and put the horse right back on track to where they're supposed to go. As opposed to if the horse does something and then you're crooked and you fix it, you're crooked and then the horse is going to just be crooked right with you. So um, working on your position is, I would say, the number one thing you could possibly do for you and your horse. Um, something that I really used for his heat and his tension were a ton of transitions. And uh, Charlotte Dujardin always says, a hot horse, you have to be able to put your legs on. A lazy horse, you have to be able to take your legs off. So always making sure you can kind of hug your, your hot horse a little bit with your calves. And if they react too much, you take the pressure off and then you put the pressure back on and you take the pressure off and you put the pressure back on again. I mean, patience is the, is the number one thing you need to have. And you can't blame your horse for their natural tendencies. Just like we have natural tendencies. (laughs) If, if someone got upset at me for being the way I am instead, you know, I'd rather them help me improve on the, you know, what I need to improve on. So instead of seeing our horses like having problems, just see them as like helping them improve and keep it really playful. And so if you have a super hot horse, you have to remember not to just stay on the hand the whole time. You have to use your seat half halt aid a lot more than your hand aid because otherwise you're just gonna be working backwards all the time. But like a squeeze with your calf eventually should teach them to slow down a little bit. But um, something for hot horses, you have to be able to wrap yourself around them so that you can have enough control over all of their power. And then eventually it becomes amazing because you have a hot horse on your aids and then you just get to ride a little Ferrari around the show arena. Um, But yeah, Ramazadi, I would say your seat and your position is key to becoming a great rider. And then the next horse is Holy Man. And he was perfectly named because he was the perfect horse. He was um, my mom's horse, actually. My mom started riding to do an activity with me and she's just amazing. And then she, but I'm one of six children and we all played sports. (laughs) So she had to go take care of the other five children. And um, I I took over her horse and he, I think he was like a pre-St. George horse. And he taught me so much. So I got to really learn everything on him, um, like all the movements, all the, the nuances, a little bit of like working up the levels towards the pre-St. George. And he was the opposite of Ramazadi. He was very, very lazy. So he taught me how to ride a lazy horse. And again, he's not trying to be lazy to be bad or nasty he's that's just who he is so me just getting upset and kicking him forward isn't helping him either so for a lazy horse you really have to find a way to make it playful and you have to make it a game for them to be like oh I want to go forward I'm excited to go forward and again and it takes a while it's not just like two kicks and one circle and you're there maybe it takes 15 minutes maybe it takes 15 days maybe it takes five months or something but little by little you can chip away and get them to react to your leg more so instead of again with the lazy horse instead of gripping the whole time where they just become duller and duller you give them a touch and then you let go and if they don't respond you give them a touch and then you let go and you repeat that again and again and again and you become a broken record until that horse responds to your legs at the snap of a finger and then um and then from there you go into your movements and you do the exact same thing so i would get him in front of my leg 
And then I'd go into his shoulder in and he'd slow down, but then I'd have to come with the leg and keep him in the shoulder in and then he'd slow down. And so it's really that, again, the fundamental you put onto the horse is what you're going to carry through the movements. And you're always going to have to kind of have that thought in the back of your head, no matter what you're doing, they won't necessarily just carry what you started at the beginning of the ride through the end. You have to keep refreshing them. Um, and then also in the movements, uh, this is what I do so much in the Grand Prix, like say I'm in a half pass, you really have to think you refresh the movement. You don't just sit there static holding it. You really have to almost re rewrite it. So how you start a half pass, almost think you restart it again in the middle. And then at the end, I always think of a movement that it has a start and it has a middle and it has an ending, no matter how short it is. If you're doing a five it for five meters sideways or a half pirouette it has so many parts of it and if you ride each of those parts that's how you get your eight otherwise you start something beautifully I've seen this so many times when I'm teaching it's a beautiful start to a half pass and then it just kind of dies out halfway through and then may and then maybe you fix it by the end but you're already too late the judges see it so fast and they're just they drop it down and you have to get every you squeeze every point out of every test that you possibly can um and that's the thing too you don't have to have nines on every movement if you get sevens on every movement you're at a 70 basically so you just have to be consistent and solid in that show arena and um that's really going to help you have a good test another tip about tests i would say is that if the most the more accurate you can be the less you're going to give the judges to take away points as well. So say you write a beautiful half pass, but it's two meters later than the letter, your score is going down. So I think for me, I always think to arrive a foot before everything and it helped. Then I pretty much end up right on the letter because the horse, I think moves a lot faster than we think it's moving a lot of times. And so I always, a lot of times I tend to get to the letter a little bit late so I always have to think early. And then when I'm asking for my transition, my upward transition, I think early. My downward transition, I think early. For my halt, I think a little bit early. And then if you think that way, you're pretty much right on time. So Holyman really taught me a lot about test riding and how to pick up points. Even he wasn't very fancy, but he was very solid. So um, you don't have to have a fancy horse. You just have to have an accurate test to have a good score, to have a great score. Okay. That's very, very hard, but to have a, a good solid score where you can get your, your bronze and your silver and your gold, you have to have an accurate test and your horse has to be on your aids and just don't give the judges any excuse to take a point away as much as possible. You know, of course, mistakes are going to happen, but, um, as much as you can prepare and stay ahead of your horse and stay ahead of the game, especially in test riding. That's what you have to do. And again, test riding is a whole nother animal, you know, home riding, you can fix things all the time. And then test riding, you have to cover up everything and make it look pretty. So that's also a whole nother nuance to dressage. And again, it's just like when you go in that show arena, you need to show off you and your horse and your harmony and what you can do and just don't give the judge an excuse to take points down okay so the next horse was teddy so i met teddy the day after he was born as a foal and i fell in love with him and i ended up getting him so he taught me how to take a young horse up through the levels and he was a big big boy he was like 17 2 and I was 15 at the time or something, and he was very, very strong. So he taught me how to ride a very strong horse. And again, everything that I had to use on him, I learned from Rami and Holy Man. So instead of pulling all the time, which is all I wanted to do, honestly, <laughs> I just wanted to pull his face off because he was so strong and he was yanking me around everywhere. But um. It, he had to learn to listen to my seat. And when I sat down and closed my leg, he had to close himself up. And of course, you're going to use your hand for a half halt. You're not just going to sit there and not use your hands. But um, if you think too much backwards with your hand, then your horse is going to look too much backwards as well. So 
a lot of transitions. I did a lot, so many like 10 meter circles to walk, to change direction, really, especially the horses are really smart too. And they get, I think they can get bored just like we can. I do so many um, different like geometric lines in my rides all the time. And just like sometimes make up lines, do a a leg yield to a shoulder in to a rhombus to a 10 meter circle to a leg yield like you can do so many gymnasticizing movements and no matter if your horse is hot if it's lazy if it's strong if it's too soft it's going to help improve your horse if it's crooked to one side most horses are are um, softer to one side than the other i find especially a lot while i'm when i'm teaching i for me i think they're usually softer on the left side maybe everybody watching has a soft right side, but, um, most of the horses are softer on the left side. And so to keep that even, sometimes I think I have like five pounds in one hand and maybe seven pounds in the other. And it, your hands are exactly in the same position, but one hand has to have a little more weight than the other, just to straighten them out. Um, until at least they're working a little bit straighter. And then you're using your legs to push them into that contact to keep them moving forward all the time. But um, yes, a lot. Of, oh, Teddy's changes. Nightmare. <laughs> they were so, so difficult. <laughs> Honestly, I still have neck problems because of the whiplash he gave me during those changes. <laughs> so some uh tips for changes that I learned on him over and over again. Um, first of all, you have to find, figure out your horse's strength. Um, if they like doing it sometimes off of a, I'll go like a quarter line and a leg yield to the rail. And then you get them off that, that leg. And then you, you change for him. He loved to do like kind of a 10 meter circle flying change, 10 meter circle. Charlotte Dujardin does this. You can look it up on YouTube somewhere. Um, so say you're at one end of the arena and you like imagine a 20 meter circle. And so you come through the corner going towards like the long side and you kind of make a very short diagonal back towards the entrance. And then you do flying change and turn the other way. And then you kind of keep making this like diagonal figure eight line. Um, and it really helps because when you're teaching a young horse, they, you can't collect them a ton and they always want to jump so much after. So the, the turn naturally is going to help slow them down without you having to pull and I, for changes especially changes and pee off you cannot add stress in those moments those as soon as like in the grand prix those are the, the biggest telltale signs of if you have a good grand prix horse or your one time piece in your pee off so you really have to give your horse time and if it's difficult just keep coming up with new exercises for it but you can't um, let them know that it's a stressful situation if they're not getting it, because that will stick in their head forever. And it's going to be a problem for a long, long time. So make sure you have someone to help you, if, especially if your horse is difficult in those changes. Um, another one is like a teardrop. So I do this with my other young horse. So if you're going like down the long side and you get almost to the end, you just kind of make a, a half 10 meter circle and then go back towards the rail. And then I do my change either when I'm heading towards the rail or when I'm in the counter canner on the rail, you just have to kind of feel when your horse is ready for it. But really the quality of the canner is the most important part for the change. We always think of just the change, not everybody, but I, I should say I do a lot. <laughs> and the students I teach, you can see where we can or can or can or, and then we're like, Oh, I got to get ready for the change. And then you switch your body and you, you let go of one rein and you throw yourself to the side. And sometimes you have to help your horse out a little bit for sure. Sometimes you have to lean or you have to, you know, your position isn't going to be the most pretty when your training changes always, but ideally it will, it'll be pretty straightforward. But um, you have to think the quality of the canner is the kind of change you're going to get. So if you really have a good, active, jumping, connected canner, that you, you have to uh, at least get that before you even try for a change. And also, I do a ton of um, 
trot canners to change leads and a ton of walk canners. That's going to tell you right there if you're going to be able to get your change or how easy or difficult it's going to be. Um, your horse should do them like butter before you do changes really. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be before you do changes, but I would highly recommend it because every single horse I've ever trained changes on, um, the better their walk canners were, the better the changes are. And also they're just so used to that new canner leg aid switching. They already understand a little bit what you want, even if they're confused on how to do it. They're like, oh, we've done this so many times in the trot and the canner that I, I can figure out I need to switch my legs. So, I mean, I would just make canner lead changes through the trot and through the walk like absolute butter. Um, and then just really remember the quality of your canner when you're training the changes. And if you lose the quality of the canner, stop doing changes and get the canner back. Um, you, I, I'm like really big into fitness and I train a lot. I have never, ever, ever in my life seen an improvement by overtraining. It's only burnt me out. It's only injured me. It's only frustrated me. Um, you can a hundred percent overtrain your horse. I don't even think you can undertrain a horse really, or at least none of us have because we're all neurotic dressage riders. <laughs> so um, in the kindest way possible, I say that because I'm one of you. Um, it's out of love, <laughs> out of passion. Um, but yes, uh, never be afraid you're not doing enough or you didn't try enough that day. We just, we can ride dressage ideally till we're 80 years old. So um, we got a long time in the sport and hopefully our horses have a long career ahead of them. And um, I would just say you can, the best thing you can give your horse is your patience and flying changes and pee off are something you have to be patient for. Some horses get it. I taught one horse last year. He got it in 24 hours. And another horse, at Teddy, it took him six months to not break my neck. And then probably like two years to actually get a solid change. So, um, and it wasn't necessarily anything. And I was learning. So I, in hindsight, I would do I would get them quicker now, but still they were very hard for him. He had like very long stifles. He's very big. He's super gangly. Um, and in the end, once he got strong, he got him overnight. So just really, really be patient with your horse and, um, throw a lot of bending lines in there for them. If they run away, turn them, don't pull them back because already that's going to add stress. You're going to add you're, you're asking for so much already. They're like, their brains are getting their steam coming out of their ears already. And then we're asking them to stop right after they tried to switch all of their legs around. And I would just, instead of wanting to pull back, just throw circles in there all the time turns. And, um, that's going to slow them down for you and get you more control. And then the next one, oh, I do have a question in the chat already there. You're, you're so good at communicating the importance of patience and, and just waiting for things, you know, making things playful. And, uh, is that kind of your personality to begin with, or did you have to kind of learn that, um, through the horses? I a hundred percent learned that I like everything fast <laughs> and I am big time on quick results. And I think not necessarily with the horses, but in my own life, like if I need to get a certain weight or something for a photo shoot, I will, you know, hit the gym three times a day if I have to, and I will get those results. Um, or like I was homeschooled. And so if I wanted to ride, I could get all my schoolwork done in the morning and I could get it done fast and I could go and do whatever I wanted. So, um, I really learned patience through training because I have made the mistake of not being patient and getting frustrated and asking too much and asking one time too many. And that one time too many screwed it up for months. So, um, the more horses I've ridden, the more patient I've become, even though I have more horses than ever now to train up through the levels, um, now that I have so much hindsight, thankfully, from all the horses in my past, it's made me even more chill than ever on the horse. And Gunter, I think his favorite 
my favorite piece of advice he's given me is to never train emotionally. You can, it's okay to have emotions. It's good to have emotions. It's what makes us who we are. And it's what makes us passionate and, and try so hard. But if you get frustrated and not even take it out on your horses, like, you know, kicking them hard, but as in like you get mentally frustrated and then you start to ride more or ride harder or ride in a way that is not helpful for your horse because, you know, our brains go a million miles a minute. That is when it starts going downhill. So it's okay to be emotional, but don't train emotionally. Really, you really have to keep those separate. If you're frustrated with yourself, it's like, fine, I'm frustrated with myself today, but I'm not going to take it out on my horse. And I'm not going to let my horse know that I'm frustrated. Like you can, <laughs> one time I was in a photo shoot or something and I was on this little Pierre stallion and it was literally trying to bite my boot while I was riding it. <laughs> I was like petting his neck and I was like, you're so dumb. Like, so my voice was like really happy and the horse had no idea. I was so annoyed with it, <laughs> but I really was, but um, it doesn't help the horse for them to know that you're upset with them and it will only slow things down. So yes, um, it's something I've had to learn and it's something I really try and tell my students is that no matter how you feel, the horse should have a good experience throughout the ride and by the end of the ride. And that really comes out of you knowing that you're going to have to be patient that whole ride, no matter what, because in the end, they're animals. It's amazing. They're doing this at all. If I was a horse, no way I'd let anybody even ride me. <laughs> <laughs> We've got, I don't know if you have time for one more, one more quick oh, question. Yeah. We move along. Just had another one pop in. Not all horses are going to be able to break into the higher levels. Um, how and when do you decide that you've gone as far as that horse really is going to be happy going or is you're going to take them? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think a lot of times the horse will tell you, you can be working on something for a long time. You know, you can be trying the pee off or you can be trying the, the three tempies or something for the St. George. And you can tell how fatigued the horse is getting. You can tell how frazzled the horse is getting. Um, and I think it really helps to have a coach at that point or someone you trust because it, it always helps to have outside eyes too, to be like, I think it has talent for it. Just give it time. Or this is, this is too hard for the horse. It's too much for the horse. Um, like it's time to, you know, maybe sell it or, or move, move on or move him on to a different place. Um, I think knowing your horse is super, super important and listening to your horse. And if it's older, especially, um, there's definitely, even if maybe it has talent for it, there's only so many years in the horse's legs. So you, you kind of have to be happy a little bit with where they are and just try and keep them the best that they can be there. If it's maybe a younger horse and you're a little bit not sure what to do, if you aren't on a super time crunch, I would say give it a little bit of time um, and just keep asking and keep trying for that whatever movement maybe you're trying to level it up to. And if you can tell your horse is very fatigued and very frustrated and is not liking the work, that's when I would say it's that's when it's reached its limit a bit. And that's when it's time for that horse to maybe stop at that um, level that it's at. Um, just really knowing your horse and listening to it. And I think it's eventually, if you give it time, you know, you're like, okay, I have three, three to six months to really put in this work and see if the horse can do this or if it, it hates it. And either the horse is going to show some improvement or it's going to just get, it's going to stay the same and be stagnant and be, get sick of the work. Um, Cause I know a lot of horses that do like you give it a year and it comes around. I've had a horse like that where he, every time he pee up, I'll tell you about him in a second. Every time he pee up, he ran to the other end of the arena. But um, that was more, he had like PS, PTSD from his previous rider. Um, Cause you can improve the horse's gates and you can improve certain things. But if you can, if you maybe set a certain amount of time and say, okay, I'm going to keep working on this without overtraining it. And it's just too much for the horse. That's when I would definitely say this is, this is good for this horse. 
Thank you. Yeah. Okay. The next horse, my favorite, is Sunday Boy. <laughs> this what is was is my heart horse. He was my first big time horse. He used to be my trainer, Grinter Seidel's, and I kind of just found him by accident in Holland. And the first ride was absolute magic. And he took me to um, my first, he won my first Young Rider Championship and U25 Championship and Nations Cup and became one of the most successful Young Rider horses in US history. And he is an absolute legend. I owe him so much. He's the reason I do this sport. He's the one after I won that national championship, I said, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. So anything I do, um, I owe it all to him. He, first of all, was massive and he came from a six foot three German man who was my coach. So me being, I think I was, I'm five, seven and I was 18 at the time that really started me on my fitness journey. I was not strong enough to ride him when I first got him and I was not able to do the things that I needed to do because I wasn't fit enough and I wasn't strong enough. And I never wanted to feel like that again. So if you see my Instagram and you think I'm nuts, okay, you don't have to do backflips in the gym. That's just for fun. <laughs> but um, it makes a huge difference to be fit enough to ride your horse. I never, ever, ever again wanted to have to take a walk break because I was out of breath or because I couldn't physically do it. And I know there's a lot of people and who are working full-time jobs and don't have time to work out. And that's totally fine. But if you really want to ride the upper levels Grand Prix and be as efficient as possible, then um, working on your fitness makes a huge, huge difference. There are he, some questions. I'm getting some questions about your, your routine and your recommendations as far as your own yes. training. Yes. So I have been working out since I was three years old. I was a gymnast. So I love doing everything for, I think a lot of times you think of the gym and it's not a good feeling. So you have to find things you love doing. That's the number one thing. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you go hiking, if you like taking long walks, if you like Pilates, swimming, biking, you need to find exercises that you like. That is the number one thing. And you can get fit doing whatever you like doing. Um, for me, I, I always do cardio because in the Grand Prix, let me tell you, if, <laughs> every time I go to that walk break, I want to throw up. It is exhausting. <laughs> That's how I always say that, you know, you've done a good Grand Prix if you want to throw up by the walk break, because you're just using every single ounce of strength and cardio that you have. So I always do cardio and then I always do some kind of strength training. I don't go super heavy. I have a lot of injuries actually from riding. Um, so I don't push myself too much, but I definitely, I get my heart rate up and a lot of exercises also I do are like, um, with the bands and you can, the great thing about nowadays, if you can go on YouTube and you can find any workout that you want and it's all free. So, um, I, really for working out a hundred percent. I find something you like doing and find workouts on YouTube and just follow them. And I guarantee you, you're going to feel better and you're going to find something you like, and you're going to find what works for you and your body and your training program. Um, I have a friend named Jack Latour and he has like rider specific fitness program. Um, so you can hit him up and, um, but yeah, find stuff you like doing and you'll get fit doing that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Sunday boy. What did I learn on him? So many things. So he was also a very strong boy and he, sorry, my camera's sliding. There you go. He was um, not super forward, but he was like hot enough. So again, I use what I learned on Holy Man to like, just literally the entire test, I'm just re-energizing him the entire time. And I think that's such a cool thing about dressage is you can't see all of these aids, but we are giving a million little aids all the time. I really feel like test riding is just like crash correction the whole time, honestly. Like you're, 
I've never sat there and ridden through a test where I'm like, okay, I just, I did a half pass and I did an extension. I'm literally like, oh, he's about to fall out of the half pass. I need to put my inside leg on or, oh, he's about to break in the pirouette. I need to put my legs on or he's going to miss the changes. I need to put more outside rain on or something. So if your dressage test feels chaotic, welcome to the club because <laughs> that's what it is, but it's a fun chaos, you know? Um, his for him bending was excruciatingly hard so half passes were very very hard he was super stiff and I confirmationally it made sense because he was so powerful and he was so thick and sturdy and wide that obviously it would he's not a naturally bendy horse the ones that are long and spindly and noodly are the great bendy ones but then they're not as powerful for pf passage so you always have a give and take with a horse depending on their confirmation. And so for, for bending, I always would do a ton of gymnastic exercises. So I would go down the long side and the haunches in, and then I would do a 10 meter circle into a shoulder four. And then I would do a 10 meter circle into a rom ver. And you're just always bending that rib cage from your inside leg over and over and over and, or, and then if you think in your half passes, you have to think of your inside leg as like a, a post almost. You have to keep that leg on. We never want to keep that leg on because we're like, I have to go this way. I don't want to keep my inside leg on. But that's the leg they're bending around. So if you think of your inside leg as the post, they're bending around. Your outside leg and your outside rein are helping wrap him around your inside leg. And then your inside rein is steering them over. So you have to have every single leg and hand on in the half pass. And you can also train um, like extra bend in your haunches in. Sometimes Gunter would have me do that. You don't do it a ton because it is ex a little extreme for the horse, but go there sometimes where you get extra, you go down the long side and you get extra haunches in, see if you can do it. And if you can't do it, that's how you know you need to go there more because then your horse is not going to do it for you ever. <laughs> Um, if you ask for it in the, in the half pass and you lose your haunches and you ask for more haunches, they're just going to say, I don't need to bend because I don't normally have to listen to your leg like that. So, and sometimes also you really have to think about the rib cage. So I would go like half pass and then keep him in that half pass shape and lay yield him back the other way and then half pass again, and then lay yield the other way. And then you can do so many playful things like this. It's one of my favorite things to do. I just play with this all the time and you just make your horse your noodle. And so you can go half pass to shoulder in, back to leg yield, back to half pass, back to leg yield, back to round bear. And you just keep playing with the bend and it's gonna show you how honest your horse is to your aids or how dishonest they are. And really getting that horse to bend around your inside leg through your outside leg, outside rein is so huge for the half passes and then keeping the impulsion as well. Half passes are, for me, I think they're very awkward. They're one of the hardest movements, I think. Um, especially when you get to the Grand Prix, every, every single test. I've not had a test yet where I don't think, holy crap, at the start of my half pass. Because I have to get from B to E or not V, like K to e or something it's 20 meters to go all the way to the other side of the ring it's so so hard and if your horse is not on your aids you're late every time every single time that ground pre half pass is so hard um and then like in the i1 you have the half pass zigzag or the i2 you have the half pass zigzag or the fourth level is also insanely hard um I love third level because it gives you a nice 10 meter circle to go into the half pass. So those are actually great to practice as well. Um, that, that third level in general is a, is a great test to practice if your horse is ready for that. Um, it just has good long lines, good bending lines. Um, and then also like walk pirouettes. Sunday boys, pirouettes were, were very good, but he always had a tendency to want to get a little bit behind me. So for pirouettes, I always love to school walk pirouettes because it's going to show you exactly what they're going to do in the pirouette. If your horse starts to spin, if it starts to fall out, if the haunches start to push against your outside leg, that's exactly what they're going to do in the pirouette. So you can never train too many walk pirouettes to get the feel for your canter pirouette. Just don't drive your horse crazy with them because they can definitely be driven crazy. But um, for the canter pirouettes also, oh, sorry, did you have a question? 
Uh, okay. <laughs> for the canner pirouettes also Gunter always he almost never lets me do a small pirouette rarely sometimes I get in the test and I'm like I have not done a small pirouette in a very long time I hope this works out but um it in doing a little bit bigger pirouettes makes you it forces you to have more control in that pirouette and you can play with the sizes all the time I almost I, I so rarely do one size pirouette I'm I do two steps more turning and then I go out and then I go back in and then I go back out and it's if you can do that you're going to have so much control over your pirouette it's not even funny and it's a great feeling it gives you so much confidence I think pirouettes, it's hard to have confidence in because it's such a, it's kind of a scary movement. You have to bring your horse back and put it on a tiny circle and hope it doesn't break the whole time. It's very, very hard. And some horses are great at it. Some horses are not good at it. I typically have had horses that are not very easy at them. And so I, that's probably why I have like anxiety about it. Um, but it's uh, just playing with the size of the, the pirouette circle is so is such a good exercise also um put them on like squares so if you go straight and you just do a quarter pirouette and then you go straight out and then you do quarter pirouette and then you go straight out and then you do quarter pirouette and then straight like just keep making squares and it's gonna make you be in control of the turn and then the out and the in which is that's your pirouette right there Okay, next horse is Wilton. Oh boy. This horse <laughs> is the most aggravating horse I've ever ridden in my entire life. <laughs> Let me tell you, learning how to not train emotionally, I can say I've done it <laughs> because this is the horse that taught me how. Um, he was a jazz and I know there are a lot of good ones out there but there are also a lot of kooky ones and he absolutely had a screw loose. He was not one of the good ones. He is a horse I never should have bought. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in that situation as well. And you just have to make the best of it. Sometimes I had to make the best of it. And by the end, I do have to say, I knew that horse almost better than Sunday boy, because I had to basically to survive. Um, I had to know every single one of his quirks. I had to know, when it was coming, I had to know how to calm it down or catch it or like avert the crisis before it happened in order to get through a Grand Prix test. And this horse truly is a horse that I think made me a professional rider. He was so difficult and he um, was very dangerous. And um, I learned so much on him. So it's like, again, you know, you you can learn so much from every single horse and the ones that aren't always the funnest sometimes are the most important ones in your life. Um, he was spooky. He was strong. He was not super forward. He was trained pretty inverted. He had an under neck, just everything you can think of this horse had. Um, thankfully he had a beautiful canner. So we had something to work with but he did have a major hangup in the pee off. Every time you asked for the pee off, he would either rear or he would run backwards. The first time I ever asked for pee off after I had bought him, he, we started pee offing at seat. He ran all the way out the arena, past A, backwards the entire time. I couldn't stop him. So <laughs> that was a good experience. Um, and so with, with a horse that has such an extreme trigger like that, you have to not attack it every day but you also can't never touch it so we didn't go there for a while I had to just let him get used to me and I had to get used to him but the key with a horse that is explosive or spooky or has a big trigger is when you're asking for something you have to always have an escape for them so they mentally know that there's a way out because Again, there's some kind of reason for it. There's some kind of mental block. So if you're asking for a pee off or whatever your horse's problem is, when I would ask for his pee off, I would put him not on the rail. So I would be on the quarter line or the inside rail. And my outs, my not outside, my inside aids would be on. So say the rail is on my right side. And then I'm pee offing 
My left leg, left rein is so solid. He is not going to the left. None of his body's going to the left. He's not allowed to go that way. And that's very solid. So that's a boundary. And that's telling him you cannot cross this line. But my right-sided aids are soft. I'm like, if you want to go that way, you are free. If you start to freak out, you're free to go to the rail because then the rail can help me catch him a little bit. Um, so you have to be clever in finding the boundary and letting them have an escape somewhere. And the escape, I always want to be forward. I never want the escape to be backwards. So whatever he does, it has to be a forward reaction. And if he gives me a backward reaction, immediately I go forward and then I bring him back again and I ask for that pee off. So whatever you're, <clears throat> sorry, I'm like choking on air. <laughs> whatever your horse's problem is, um, whenever you go to touch it, make sure there's some kind of boundary and there's some kind of release somewhere. And you just keep playing with that over and over and over until you can close up the, where the release side is and, and you can touch both sides. And then if they do feel stuck or claustrophobic, they just go straight forward. So by the end, I was able to keep both legs, both reins on. And if he did have a freak out, his reaction would be to trot forwards, which is amazing. So, you know, it's eventually you make their maybe stress reaction, a positive reaction for you which is, it's, it's, it's difficult, I know, and it's nuanced and it's, it's hard, but um, I do see questions coming in. So if you I need to ask, ask me again. I was going to say, uh, there's some questions here. So what positive quality yes. did he have that made you uh, able and want to learn how to not trigger the dangerous actions? Uh, like what attracted to you, to him in the first place? That's, yes, that was a great question. <laughs> so um, I think a lot of us have been here um, I was with a different trainer at the time and I was young. And when we got him, I didn't necessarily know what I was looking for. Um, and I kind of trusted this person to help me find a good horse. And this person, I honestly think they also didn't know what they were looking for. So I'm not blaming them, but I think it was just the wrong team. I was on the wrong team. And, um, he did have some good qualities. Like again, his canner was fabulous. His pirouettes, his changes, fabulous. Like he's 20 years old now. My friend has him and I can still get on and do pirouettes and changes for an eight. And most of the Grand Prix is canner work. So if, as long as you get through the trot half passes, okay, <laughs> then, um, you have twos, ones, pirouettes, extendeds. Um, you have so much canner work. So there was a huge plus to, to that. And he also didn't show his jazz side when we tried him. Um, if that answers that question. <laughs> There's also some, some of our members are not quite familiar with the jazz. Is that a, a line of a specific breed? Yes, that is a sire, a major breed. Um, it's, a, it's a Dutch breed, KWPN in Europe. Um, and it is definitely, if you're looking for a horse and it has jazz in it, I've known wonderful jazzes, absolutely wonderful. So I'm not going to just say stay away, but it's something to be aware of hundred percent. Thank you. Um, and then do you feel that this was kind of his character that he would react like that or a response to poor early training? I think it was 50, 50. He's genuinely a spooky horse. He hundred percent had a screw loose. And then he also, I think someone beat the crap out of him for having a screw loose and now put that together and that's a recipe for disaster absolutely so the I think the reason we were able to kind of rehab him and turn him into a horse that got second twice in the U25 championship was because he learned to trust me and he learned that I wasn't going to beat him even if he reared even if he ran backwards um, and I wasn't going to respond in a way that was harsh and uncomfortable for him. So I would say half is genuinely his personality. I mean, the horse had so many quirks. If I had two cross ties on him and put the saddle on and tighten the girth, he reared up and flipped over like no reason. So you have to take the cross ties off, walk him out of the cross ties and then do the girth. And that's genuinely just a quirk of his. He was head shy. He would also charge you if you passed his stall. I don't know what that, I don't know if that was just him or if he had someone that literally beat his face. Um, I, 
I had a guy, I don't know the guy who owns him now. Um, he's a Liberty trainer and he does all the, like the free Liberty stuff. And it's really cute to watch him. But he also was like, I think someone beat this horse for being how he was because he doesn't react normally. So he's, he's half genuinely just born a psycho. And then the, the, it was extremely exacerbated by someone, I think, beating him a bit. So it also is kind of a sweet story. I think that we were able to rehab the kooky little horse and he was able to be so successful, even with his little brain. <laughs> Thank you for being so candid about that. That's, I know a lot of, a lot of us have the not perfect horse and um, ideally not dangerous, but yeah, it's, it's hard. Thank you. For sure. Yeah, it is. And I think I, if you look on Instagram and Facebook, everything is somebody's highlight reel. And for me, even, I mean, I'm at the world cup and I go on Instagram and I feel defeated because I'm like, Oh, well, this person's doing this and this person's doing that. And I'm not, I'm not there yet. And I'm not getting nineties yet or whatever. And, um, I think you have to be careful the, the media you take in because everybody only puts their highlights on and I'm close friends with a, a pretty big influencer over here. And he put on his private story. He's like, today, I just, these are the days I want to quit. Like a horse got loose. One of them went lame, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, if everybody said that on their public media all the time, everybody would realize how normal it is for horses to go lame. New horses, brand new horses you just bought. Horses right before championships go lame. How you have kooky horses, how horses, like it's a very hard sport. And it's not all fun and games. And it's, it's honestly, for me, my career, it's just as much heartbreaking as it has been positive. And um, I think that's what makes us so tough and resilient is because the sport is so, so hard and we keep going and we keep trying and we keep getting back up. And I think that's what makes equestrians so special is that you know, uh, basketballs can't go lame. Golf balls don't have their own ideas. And it's devastating when your horse goes lame. I mean, I've Sunday boy was lame half of his career. Nobody knew that, but I missed out on half of his career. Wilton, the only reason he retired, all the, all the, um, the media said she, she, she quit because he was too difficult. He went lame. <laughs> I didn't quit. <laughs> he went lame and I decided he didn't need to he was 18 and he didn't need to do anymore um the whole reason I have Davinia is because my good horse Don Diego passed away because of an injury that's why she's my little miracle mare so these are all the stories people don't necessarily know um but it's it's what makes us who we are and it's what makes us so tough and I think if you're going through a hard time, you just have to know that you're not alone because it is a very hard sport and every single rider is going through the same thing. And now that I'm able to be a little bit among the top riders and see them and go into their stables and talk to them, all of them are the same. Nobody's different. They just have more horses. So <laughs> when their horses are lame, they have more to show. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the next one after the kooky horse is Don Diego. And this horse oh, just breaks my heart. He's one of the most special horses I will ever ride in my entire life. We found him in Holland, just this 18 hand massive horse, but like a total ladies ride. He was pretty Dutch trained, um, which is a bit different than the German riding style. The German riding style is a little bit more very classical and Dutch is a little bit more they not everybody there are a lot, I know a lot of good Dutch riders but they tend to have the head lower and the the nose more in um and so really getting him to use his hind leg and work him through the back was huge for him so if you have a horse maybe that wants to sit behind the contact you really have to just keep attacking the hind leg and getting the back to come up and sometimes too even if your horse isn't strong in the contact if it's up and out just let it stay there and don't be too strong for a while just let it get muscle memory until it starts to get stronger and pulls into the contact when it's up and out and stretching and the nose is on the vertical so don't be afraid 
that it's too light if the frame is in the right position, basically, is what I had to do. And then eventually he learned, oh, this is where I stay. But at first they don't, their muscles are so like this. So you just have to put them up and out and um, let their muscles get strong and let them know that this is where you're supposed to be. And then they realize, oh, this is comfortable and, and I like this. Um, but yeah, he was, I don't have much to say about him because he was absolutely fantastic. And we got to do two shows and then he had an injury that they actually somehow uh, slipped by us on the vet check and he ended up not being able to stand anymore. So we had to put him down in the fall of 2020. And that is where Davinia comes in. And this is why she's my little miracle mare. And this is why I am obsessed with her on Instagram. I'm just, if you go on my Instagram, it's literally all chestnut mare. But there's there's a huge reason behind it because we got her because um, because Donnie died and my the most special horse I've ever owned passed away and we just got her to have a horse to show in the competition arena. She wasn't expensive. I bought her off of a video, and we just got her to have so I could get more experience in the Grand Prix. And she ended up being this absolute dynamo of a horse who is now going to the World Cup, who has blown everybody away because nobody, including me, expected any of this. And I think it shows what can happen with correct work and correct training. And I think it proves you don't have to have the most expensive horse. It has to be a good horse, but it doesn't have to be the most expensive. I guarantee you in that Grand Prix arena in Wellington, she's the cheapest one out there every single time. But with, if you train your horse correctly, and if you are a good rider and you have accurate tests, you can make a lot happen. Um, and, and she's not the, she's be, actually become more than we ever knew she could. Also, I think, um, I didn't think she really could move the way she moves now. And just, she kept at it. And She's gotten more muscled and she's, she's blown us away. And I think she will keep continuing to blow us away. Now, how, um, how long have you had her? I've had her since the fall of 2020. So a year and a half, a little more than a year and a half. kind of. Um, yeah, we, uh, I imported her and her breeding is, she is a Hanoverian. She's Don Frederico Jungle Prince, which I had no experience with. I never even owned a mare before this. <laughs> Nonetheless, a chestnut mare. So uh, I definitely learned that you don't tell mares to do anything. They allow you to do everything. Um, and we are lucky enough that they let us ride them because they're so smart. Um, but in the end, if you get a good mare on your side, there's no feeling like it. Uh, don't get me wrong. I love my geldings. And I like stall some stallions too, but um, there I've never had a horse try like like she's tried for me in the show arena, and especially because she's nobody expected this from her. Nobody expected her to move this big and to be this special. Um, it's just been such like a a little dream miracle story and. And again, like there's uh, so many reasons I'm so obsessed with her because she tries so hard. And so sun, um, Sunday boy ended up passing away last year from an infection right after three months after Donnie died. And then in November, I had a five-year-old, really special five-year-old and she had tumors in her stomach and I had to put her down right before I went to, I came to Florida like three months ago. And she's literally like been my rock through all of it. And she's gotten me through all of it. And um, it's just, again, she's just shown me how such beautiful things can come out of hard times also. We're getting a lot of notes in the chat about the mayor fan club. So they good. Yes. There. I love it. Yes. <laughs> big, big mayor fan. And I've, I've become a mayor collector ever since. <laughs> I have... <laughs> What do I have now? I got a, a chestnut Vitalis Philly and Germany still. I have Fiantini, who is a bay mare. I have Rapunzel, who is a bay mare. And then Faith, who passed away, was a mare. So I had a huge mare squad and I'm only looking to increase it one day. 
That's fantastic. That's awesome. So I think um, this was our last. Yeah. So if anybody has any last questions, I uh, better put them in the chat now. We are. Yeah. Anna, Anna is a busy woman. And it, what is it? Midnight, one o'clock in the morning over there? It is 2.30 in the morning right now. Anna, I can't thank you enough for your time. Now we're getting, we're getting some thank yous for your, your honest and candid presentation and insights. That's yeah. Absolutely. It, it, we really appreciate it. It means so much to, to see the realities of you yeah, know, what absolutely. the story is like. Cause like you said, we end up seeing a very curated view all the time. So absolutely. Anna, thank you so much. It's really inspiring to hear the truth behind your success and your resilience really comes through in this. So we all wish you continued success. Look forward to hearing more about stories. So thank you so much, especially given the time for you. Um, and we will Absolutely. let you get back to sleep. And for everybody who was here for our last you to know how for this series, thank you so much. And really want to give a shout out to Don uh, and the Education Committee for keeping this going. So Thanks, everybody. Hope to see you in the show ring and have a good evening. Thank you all. Looking forward hey, thanks, to seeing you. Thanks, guys. Goes, Anna. Good yeah. luck. Thank you. Yes. If anybody ever needs anything, too, I always tell you just reach out to me on Instagram. I'm here for you. So thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so thanks, much. Thanks, Anna. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.